Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Trail cameras are popular with those who enjoy hunting, nature, and generally spending time outdoors. Since the cameras were first introduced in the 1990s, technology has evolved by leaps and bounds. Today's cameras utilize motion sensitivity, image and video timing, and even GPS tracking capabilities. Across the Fence spoke with an expert to get some tips on the most effective ways to use a trail camera. I'm Josh Morse. Um, I'm the public information officer at Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and I do a lot of the department's photography, um, video, and media and stakeholder outreach. So sort of by extension, trail cameras are a natural part of your professional work? Mm -hmm. They fit right in. So I got interested in trail cameras while I was doing grad school in wildlife conservation. And when I started with the department, that same set of tools, photo, video, outreach, makes them a really handy resource. Now a lot of people will know this, but what are some of the ways that a trail camera or cameras are used, Josh? I think trail cameras are becoming popular with all sorts of users. One of the most interesting things about them right now, you'll see wildlife photographers using them to scope out good places to get that perfect shot. You'll also see backyard enthusiasts using them just to get a sense of who is in the neighborhood. You know, am I seeing the same bear? Is it three different bears? And you'll see hunters using them to get a sense of, is this area gonna be fruitful for me to spend my time in November? What are ways that you're using trail cameras in the Department of Fish and Wildlife? We use trail cameras in a number of monitoring studies. You've probably heard about our work on the moose population in Vermont, keeping tabs on that species. And we're actually part of a group of Northeastern states working with a UVM postdoc to put trail cameras out throughout the moose range and get a sense of what that population is doing. We also partner with the Nature Conservancy, with Cold Hollow to Canada, and we look at everything from amphibian passage under highways to uh, mammal movement in northeastern Vermont, all using trail cameras. Um, trail cameras, sort of in the history of Vermont conservation, helped us discover that American Martin restoration had been a success when we tried to bring that endangered species back. And we've used them to watch timber rattlesnake dens over time lapse. Tell us a little bit more about how much we can spend, how sophisticated mm -hmm. can we get, mm -hmm. what do we need? Yeah, so the last couple years we've seen trail cameras get much cheaper um, and much more advanced. They take better photos, great videos, they can send photos right to your phone, and you can pick up a trail camera for $50 or $500. So I can spend $50 or $500? What am I getting? What's the difference? That's a great question. I'm going to answer it in terms of what someone who is just getting into trail cameras might look for. All your trail cameras are going to have some basic features in common. A lens captures the image, infrared to detect wildlife at night and illuminate it at night, and then a detection field that is going to be what picks up motion and triggers the camera. Open them up, and this is a great place to put your name and phone number. Um, you'll have on-off features, dials to set whether you want video, whether you want photo, and then a little field to put in your SD card the same as a digital camera. This is what collects the photos. So a good entry-level camera, you want it to do two things. You want it to have a reasonable photo detection field um, so a camera, when you buy it, it's going to say, takes photos out to 60 feet. That's going to be the distance that it can see wildlife moving at. And you also want it to have a pretty quick refresh time. So that way, if a bobcat zips through, you're getting a couple photos when it crosses the field. And again, that info is right on the box. You can get a camera with a good refresh time and a good field of view, $50, $75.
Josh, what tips can you share with our viewers about sort of the best practices or how to get something set up? So this is a great thing about trail cameras um, for anyone who's interested in wildlife. They're really easy and they're really fun. If you're looking to just start out, all you need to do is find a part of your property or some state land where you know wildlife are traveling and you can put that camera right on their line of tracks, you know, right on the quarter going over the beaver dam and you'll start getting pictures. What we have right now, this camera down the trail, a bunch of little twigs and brush in front of it, this is going to capture a lot of videos of leaves dancing in the wind which is not what we're going for. Always pick a location with as little brush and as little disturbance as possible. It might be as simple as looking at that line of tracks where you think the wildlife is moving and saying, all right, they're coming out of the brush here, but I have an open view if I just shift my angle a little bit and moving that camera so that it's got a clear field. I think a lot of the fun of trail cameras comes from letting them sit out there and then going back and pulling that photo card, seeing what happened over a couple weeks. But practically, wildlife are gonna know if you're coming into an area and they're gonna adjust their behavior if you're going and pulling your card every couple days. Expect to be amazed right off the bat, but don't expect amazing pictures. What I mean by that is you're very likely to see wildlife that you didn't know were in your neighborhood on that first camera pull. That's exciting. That's part of why these are a great, fun, easy outreach tool, but it's going to take a long time, you know, weeks or months to really dial in your set and start getting photos that are a specific scene you want or a specific point on the landscape where the animal is moving. Um, four years into using trail cameras, I got my first bobcat holding a squirrel in its mouth. I'd been working at that for two years up to that point. Josh, you just mentioned state land. There's obviously etiquette, just like there is in any hunting and trapping. You're going to put trail cams into that same category with respect for landowners and private property rights? There's not a big set of regulations about trail cameras in Vermont. So we at Fish and Wildlife rely on people who are using them to be decent and respectful. That basically boils down to if you're going to put them on private land, ask permission. And no matter where you're putting out that camera, if someone stumbles across it, it's reassuring for them to be able to open it up and see a name and a phone number. So respect, common sense, decency, that's really key to being a good wildlife camera user um, on a landscape that we all enjoy. So you walk through an area like this and you're seeing, what, what's jumping out to you is, oh, there's a good place for a trail cam. What are you seeing when you walk through here? So what I'm most interested in is that little brook. You're gonna go from a blurry photo of a coyote running by at six in the morning to that crisp daytime shot of a coyote, you know, cruising through golden field grasses in fall. It takes time. Thanks to Josh and the Fish and Wildlife Department for sharing their knowledge and those amazing trail cam videos. Study after study show the benefits of houseplants, from cleaning the air to reducing stress and boosting your mood. In partnership with UVM Extension Master Gardener Program, Across the Fence presents today's Houseplant Hero segment to help you choose, grow, and care for your indoor plants. Hi, I'm Judy Miro, a UVM Extension Master Gardener, coming to you from the University of Vermont Greenhouse. And I'm here to help you become a houseplant hero by providing some guidance on caring for your houseplants. Today, our focus is on the asparagus cetaceous, the asparagus fern. It's a beautiful green shrub native to South Africa. And despite its name, it's not a fern at all. It certainly looks like one, and you guessed it, it's related to the vegetable plant, asparagus, the one you might grow in your vegetable garden. Asparagus fern makes a great houseplant for novice gardeners because it doesn't require special care and it looks spectacular. It grows well in bright indirect light. The brighter the light, the faster it grows. It will maintain its dense bushy mound as long as it's kept out of bright direct sunlight. The asparagus fern can tolerate periods of neglect because it has tuberous roots that store water. Of course, this plant will shine brightest with consistent watering. 
It's also the perfect plant for your kitchen or bathroom since extra humidity will do this plant wonders. The asparagus fern doesn't require fertilizer in the winter when the sun isn't as strong. Feel free to stop fertilizing from December through early March, or you can choose just to fertilize at half strength once a month in the winter. During the summer, feel free to fertilize your potted plant every other week. When the foliage yellows, it will drop and it'll let you know the soil is too dry or there isn't enough light. Old or yellowed stems should be cut back at the base and the stems should be trimmed back to keep the plant shaped. If you want to provide a little extra TLC, just mist your plant as often as you like. It'll help keep the entire plant happy. But if you're keeping the plant in the kitchen or bathroom, you've already provided that little extra humidity. So no need to mist unless you really want to. Like most plants, pests don't just show up unless the plant is stressed out. Asparagus ferns have very few pests other than aphids and mealybugs and maybe some spider mites. Remember to check for pests every time you water. If you should find any pests, isolate your plant from other house plants. You don't want to invite the little critters taking up residency elsewhere. Hose the plant off gently at the first sign of pests. Outside is best, but if it's too cold outside, bring the plant into the shower or the sink and give it a good indoor rinse to gently blast away those pests. Remove any infected stems that should come off. Once your plant is drip dry while still in the shower or sink, give it a good spray of insecticidal soap and it'll kill off any bugs that remain. Stop by your local garden center for their recommendation. Always make sure to read the directions carefully and completely before applying any pest control application and remember to wear all your required safety gear. Gloves and eye protection are always a must. Overloving this plant is generally the cause of pest infestations, so remember to water only when necessary. Remember that by providing your plants with the conditions and care they need, you too can become a houseplant hero. For more information on houseplants or home gardens, visit the UVM Extension Master Gardener website and see our garden resources page, or contact an Extension Master Gardener volunteer at the helpline. The phone number is on the screen. This is Extension Master Gardener Judy Miro wishing you happy growing. Our thanks to Judy and the Master Gardener program. And once again, thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay with me.